Okay, everyone, welcome to the second plenary lecture for fall 2016, Ways of Knowing. We're always very excited about these lectures. Um, you can tell something a little, a little unusual is up tonight. We don't usually get the bowling pins and the bowling ball. That was fun. All right, so tonight we have the pleasure of hearing from Professor Eric Green. Um, Eric Green is a professor in the Wildlife Biology Program and the Division of Biological Sciences here at the University of Montana. He grew up in Quebec, Canada. He dropped out of high school. That's always the student's favorite line in his resume. Dropped out of high school because he got an opportunity to go live in the Galapagos Islands for a year and work on Darwin's finches. After that, he worked for the Canadian Wildlife Service on seabird colonies about 800 miles north of the Arctic Circle. After these amazing experiences, he returned to school at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Then he got an undergraduate degree. There he got an undergraduate degree in biology, music, and math. He then did a PhD at Princeton University, and he currently conducts research on ecology, animal behavior, and conservation biology. His research has taken him around the world, including work throughout Montana, Central and South America, Africa, New Zealand, and the High Arctic. I've asked Eric to speak at the undergraduate research night in past years and you know it's just not fair to anybody else because he always has the best photos and the best stories and the best toys and you know the rest of us just come along with some words and ideas. He's going to give us a great uh, presentation tonight and those of you who are interested in research I will teach you how to haunt him and stalk him so that you can talk him into uh, some research opportunities. One of my students actually rode her bicycle around his neighborhood until she caught him out on his bicycle and was able to line up a research opportunity. You didn't know I set her up. Oh. <laughs> who, who, who is that? <laughs> People are quite eager to work on Professor Green's research, so we'll talk. Welcome to Professor Green. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's great to talk to you folks. It's a real honor and privilege to get to talk to students in the Honors College. Um, and when I was thinking, Lori asked me a little while ago for a title for this talk, and I was scratching down titles, and I was coming up with stuff that was really boring sounding. And so I came up with, I was thinking about what I was going to talk to you folks about tonight. And so I came up with this title, Why Science is Like Bowling, because basically it gives me an, a great excuse to dress up in all this goofy stuff, right? <laughs> but uh, what I'm the sort of take home message I want you to go away with is science is just one way uh, that humans uh, try to figure out what's going on in the universe. It's one way of knowing. And in this lecture series, you'll be exposed to, and in your courses and whatnot, you'll be exposed to lots of different ways of knowing stuff, trying to find out how things work, what's true, what's not true, and so forth. And science, in some respects, is a game that we play. And what I mean by a game is that it has a very sort of specified set of rules of how to play the game. So just like bowling, there's rules about what to do and how to score and all that sort of stuff. And science has a whole set of rules and a protocol for operating. And um, a lot of people don't quite understand how science works, how the game of science works. And so that's really what I'm going to talk about um, tonight. All right, so ever since we were all in, in elementary school, we've been exposed to the scientific method. And, and I see it every year that I start talking about science and how science works and talk about hypothesis testing and predictions and all this stuff. And everybody's eyes glaze over. Because right, we're just bored silly of this stuff. We've been getting it since third grade. And everybody goes to sleep when we 
we start thinking about this stuff. And what I found is that there's great confusion among a lot of people about what science is and how it works. And a lot of terms we associate with very specific rules of the game in science, such as hypothesis and prediction and, and how things work, are used usually completely incorrectly and interchangeably. So people will use prediction when they mean hypothesis and so forth. And, um, and I think possibly the, the people who understand how science works the least in society are politicians, um, by far. And it's a serious problem. And it has, yeah. So <clears throat> I'm going to start off with a hypothetical um, example here about how science works. And then I'm going to go into an extended example about um, using the, the game of science, the process of science, in a research project that I did when I was a student about um, your guys' age. So here's a picture of the Rattlesnake uh, Creek just near in Greeno Park. And there's any of you are fishermen, you know all about caddisflies. Yep, I see a fisherman right there. He just smiled. Yeah, so what's this? No, the, the fisherman who just smiled. What's this? Oh. What kind? Do you know? OK. All right, so there are some wicked cool caddisflies. Go to the Clark Fork or uh, Rattlesnake. Pick over, uh, turn over every rock, and you'll see really cool um, critters. Lots of caddisflies. Here's a neat one that's really common. It, whoops, here it is. Um, they live under these rocks in the streams. And they, this one, this one species, grabs little bits of twigs and uh, chews them up. And with its silk glands that it's got under its chin, it builds these little log cabins. So th this is a log cabin, this protective structure. These are things that these organisms have built by grabbing stuff out of the stream and, and putting it all together with silk. So this is one really cool caddisfly that's really common in Rattlesnake Creek. Here's another one, another species, and there's lots of species, but this is another really cool one that builds a protective structure, but it grabs little pebbles. And so it builds this nice little rock house um, out of pebbles. And here's under one rock, you can see a whole bunch of these things lined up. And these are, these are really solid structures. I mean, you have to sort of would take a rock and, and bang on these things um, if you wanted to open them up and get at the, the yummy morsel inside. So here's, so here's Rattlesnake Creek um, in Greeno Park. Let's say you go and you flip over some rocks and you start noticing these cool caddisflies, two different species. And let's say you think you observe a pattern. You think that the log cabin builder, it looks like you're finding more of them in these back little side, side pools here. And the stone cabin builders seem to be out in the middle more. So step one in science is we have to come up with interesting questions. Okay? And that interesting questions can come from a whole variety of different places. My favorite one is just observing nature, going back to mama, and observing um, cool patterns and, and coming up with intriguing questions. There's lots of other ways of coming up with interesting things that we might want to investigate. Reading papers that are published, and they have suggestions about cool questions and, and so forth. But let's just say that you go out and you think you, you observe this pattern. So you think that the log cabin builders are more on the sides where the water is shallower, tends to be slower, and it's a little bit warmer. Okay, and let's say the, the rock cabin builders are in this deeper, faster, colder water. Okay, so step one is observing patterns. We could stop here of being able to identify different caddis species, fly species, and kind of figuring out where they live and learn about how they make a living and, and all that sort of stuff. This would be natural history. And so there's tons of good naturalists who are really good, way better than I am at identifying caddis flies. But if it stops at the sort of natural history stage, um, it's, it's not 
It's not science. Step two in science is once you've identified a cool pattern that you're interested in, it's coming up with possible suggestions or reasons why you might see those patterns. So hypotheses are, are ideas or suggestions about what might help us explain that pattern. So I want you guys to help me out here. Let's say you've got species A, it's shallower, it's slower, it's warmer. Species B, it's deeper, faster, colder. Um, what are some, what's a hypothesis that might help explain this? Yes? Okay, that's a great suggestion that these things are, are very specific about what they need to build their shelters. And maybe uh, the, the twigs and stuff are, are over here and the fast moving stuff, um, they're, they're gonna be swept away. I hadn't even thought of that one. That's a great suggestion. So there's a good hypothesis. Um, what's one that might have to do with temperature? Stone houses are warmer, that could be. But sort of more generally, maybe this species um, is physiologically adapted to be able to tolerate colder conditions better. Okay, and this one, its physiological machinery is set up so it, it needs warmer temperatures. So there may be differences in how they respond to temperature that uh, makes this one prefer the warmer areas, this one prefer for the, the colder areas. So it could be a physiological explanation. Um, any other ideas anybody has? How about if they... I was just going to go on, there might be a predator in one of those areas or another, or a food source that they have. Okay, food source, we, I haven't told you what they eat but maybe the food of this, this guy is here and the food of this guy is more out here. Uh, another explanation might be competition. These guys might be actually fighting with each other or competing for places in the, to live in the stream. We know that competition can be really important in nature. So it may be that this distribution is a reflection of these two species competing and one being a superior competitor and kicking the subordinate out of the preferred habitat, micro habitat. Okay, so uh, there's a bunch, there's four hypotheses that uh, we've come up with. And so this is, so a hypothesis is simply a, a, a suggestion about what might help us explain this pattern. And prediction has a very specific meaning. And I find the easiest way to kind of keep these things clear is these are logically linked. A hypothesis, you can think of it as an if statement, and a prediction follows from a specific hypothesis. So if a certain hypothesis is true, then we predict this or this or this or this. Okay, so hypothesis and prediction are logically linked in these sort of if then sort of framework. And Lots of people use these completely interchangeably. All right, so let's just think in this um, example, this sort of made up example. So if these guys are, if the reason we see this distribution, this interesting pattern has to do with competition, what are some predictions we could make? Um, these then statements. Let's think of some experiments we might be able to do. Let's. So what, what would be able to what would be a prediction if these guys are competing? Yes. If you remove one of the other species, <clears throat> the one that's supposed to be banished would do just as well. Bingo, bingo. So that's a great experimental test of this competition hypothesis. If this is what's producing this pattern, then the prediction, the logical prediction is if if we remove this guy, B and it's keeping A out of there, we would predict that A is gonna spread out and occupy this, this area, right? 
So that's very good. That's a great prediction from this hypothesis. And there it is. Remove B and A expands. And we could do the opposite, right? May, we don't know. Maybe this is the preferred area and this is the superior competitor. So we could do, do the reverse experiment too. Remove A and see if B shifts. All right. Let's just think about this physiological thermal tolerance. Um, if the reason we see this has to do with just physiological differences, they're going to their preferred temperatures. Um, some predictions are, we could do some lab studies just to test this. Um, so we could give these guys, bring them into the lab and give them uh, different temperatures of, of water and a little artificial stream and see where they go and see how they perform. So we could do some physiological tests. Another thing, um, let's say, Think of this, you've got a stream that's going up and down a mountain. Okay, so it's gonna be colder up near the top, the water's gonna be colder, and as it goes down, it's gonna be warmer. What's another prediction we could make about the distribution of these species along the stream? Right, so if this is the warm one, we kind of predict um, as we go up and down in elevation into warmer waters, we'd expect this guy to, to go farther down and this one to go farther up. So here's a cool prediction, you know, just by, this would give you an excuse to go hiking along a creek from, from bottom to top, right, to test that. Okay, <clears throat> so very good. So now I get to use my props. Okay, so each one of these predictions we can think of as a bowling pin. Okay, we're gonna set it up. We don't know if any of these are right. Um, or not, so we've got three here. And so you suggested um, the idea that maybe there's differences in where the, the stuff for their houses is, so let's put another bowling pin for that, that prediction. <clears throat> and so step three in the process, after we sort of sit around and think up a whole list of hypotheses and logical predictions. Step three is we think of experiments or observations that we could go gather that would help us evaluate our predictions. Okay, and so our data that we collect is like this bowling ball. Okay, okay now I gotta practice my form here. Tell me how I'm doing. Sweet. 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 Okay, so oops. I'm going to have to give the rest of this lecture with the bowling ball in my hand. Um, so let me try not to break the overheads over here. So we're going to go out, do some experiments, collect, um, collect data, and our experiments and our, our data, we're throwing at our predictions. Whoops. And so uh, two of our, our predictions were knocked down, and two from the data we collected are still left standing. And so let's just say, and this is a hypothetical example, I'm just making this up, and I, I have no idea what's going on with these caddisflies, but let's just say that we did the experiment that you suggested, removing one and seeing if A expands. Let's say we did that and nothing happened. A stayed there even when B was removed. The, the data knocked this pin down. This hypothesis, so we, this prediction isn't upheld, right? And so we can reject this hypothesis, okay? So we falsified this. We can say with confidence that competition is not producing this pattern. And let's say that um, we've, so some of the pins that are left up standing um, have to do with this physiological explanation. So in the weird way that scientists work, it's a very cautious sort of approach. We don't, we never say we prove a hypothesis. We don't, we can't prove things in science. Um, we say we fail to reject this hypothesis. The pin is still standing. It doesn't mean it's the correct answer but it's still viable, okay? So um, often 
politicians or others want scientists to uh, prove things. It's sort of a, a, a cautious approach and, and we tend to say we fail to reject things, okay? All right, so now what I'm going to do is, rather than this hypothetical example, I'm going to take you through a rather extended example having to do with um, a really cool fly and jumping spiders. And these are some studies I did when I was a student. And um, so I'm going to walk you through this study, and you'll see there's going to be a hideously complicated matrix of of hypotheses and predictions, but the end result um, is that we, we were able to figure out some very cool things about this weird little fly. Okay, so a long time ago, probably before um, most of you were born, uh, there was a magazine called Natural History Magazine, which was published by the American Museum of Natural History, and every month at the end of the magazine, and um, there was a, just a cool natural history photo. And so this was published um, by a fellow named Tom Eisner. And this is the south end of a fly going north. So this is the rear end of a fly. And here's its wings. This is its thorax. And its head is up there kind of out of focus. But what you can see from this picture on the wings is there's these kind of weird dark bands, right? And so Thomas Eisner, in this photograph that he published, said that this this thing, these look like spider legs on the wings of the fly. And more specifically, he said it looked like a jumping, jumping spider uh, legs. And then he proposed a reason that this thing had these weird bands on its legs. And he said, by looking like a spider, it's going to protect it against a whole range of predators. And he suggested this would protect it against birds, that birds would see this thing and be fooled and think it's not a fly, but it's a jumping spiders, and spiders are scary, so I'm not going to eat it. And he said lizards and assassin bugs and praying mantises and all sorts of things. So he said that this, this weird stuff on the wings was, it was mimicking jumping spiders, and that protected it from basically all dangerous predators out there. Okay, I was working at the time on birds and, and looking, doing a lot of studies on what they ate and how they competed with each other and so forth. And uh, I found this to be a very intriguing picture and I didn't buy the suggestion that he made that this would, by looking like a spider, it would protect this fly against birds. Because birds, um, there's an, an essential amino acid, that means this is a, um, an amino acid that the birds cannot make themselves but it's required to make feathers. So when they're feeding babies that are essentially feather growing machines, they need this essential amino acid when they're molting and growing feathers themselves. They have to get this amino acid from somewhere they can't make it themselves. And it turns out that amino acid, that essential amino acid is really high in spiders. And so, and I know that birds, when they're molting or feeding babies, they switch over their diets and go look for spiders. So I didn't buy the idea that this is going to protect a little fly against spiders. Also, if you look at it, I, I mean, it looks like a fly. It doesn't look like a spider. It's not a very good mimic if that's what it is, right? And so I got thinking about this. Here's Thomas Eisner. He, um, he died a few years ago. He was a, a great biologist and conservation biologist at Cornell University. And... Um, so he turned me on to this with this one photograph, but I didn't buy his, what, what he was uh, proposing. So for the story I'm going to tell you, I have to tell you more about jumping spiders, and then we'll get back to the flies. Okay, jumping spiders are, um, well, not pound for pound, because they, they don't weigh a pound, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> microgram for microgram, these are, are the world's fiercest predators. Okay, these guys are um, hunting and killing machines. They have eight eyeballs on their heads, on this little turret, two big ones in the front. And actually, each of these eyeballs is, is a compound eye made up of lots of 
little eyeballs inside there. So two big ones in the front, there's two there, there's two on the side, and there's two looking backwards. So these things can see 360, and they're like little cats. They, they can stalk around. They, they don't build a web to catch food in. They're like little cats. They go around and, and jump on stuff. And these guys, these guys can, if there's a fly out here and a jumping spider here, they can jump out like a meter and nab, nab a fly in the air. They're amazing predators. They're very common right now. Uh, look around in your houses. I guarantee you, you've got jumping spiders um, in your houses. They're, if you see a jumping spider in your house, cherish it. If you've got like um, brown recluses, um, you can worry about them. But these guys are cool. Um, so here's, here you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, and there's a pair of eyes in the back. Um, they're ancient things. Here's a, a jumping spider preserved in Baltic amber. And again, uh, a, a scanning electron microscope, four, five, six, seven, eight. So amazing vision. And watching them in action is just incredible. They're, they um, are really good at, at looking around in the environment and figuring out what's out there. Now, <clears throat> so if you're a little fly, this is probably your worst nightmare, okay? Jumping spiders are really common everywhere around the world except Antarctica and way up in the Arctic. And if you're a little bug, little fly, um, this is kind of possibly your most dangerous predator. Now, jumping, here's one more bit of the story that for the whole thing to make sense. So jumping spiders, um, again, they don't build a stationary web and they just hang out in that web. They wander all over the place. But when two jumping spiders meet, uh, they can attack each other and kill each other and eat each other, okay? They do that. And so when, and they carry around little mobile territories with them. So if a jumping spider is wandering around and it thinks it might see, it sees something out there and it might be another jumping spider, they have, all jumping spiders have this sort of territorial aggressive display and it involves waving their legs. And they do a lot of leg waving um, to communicate and signal to other jumping spiders. They also do a lot of leg waving for courtship displays, which I'll show you in just a second. Um, so one of the other things is jumping spiders wave their legs a lot. And what it usually does, the behavioral response, is if a jumping spider is in stock and pillage and kill mode, and it sees like waving leg-like things, it sends a massive signal to the brain, its brain, and it, it short circuits the hunt and stock and pillage mode, and it, it gets it out of that, and it's like, uh-oh, there might be a dangerous jumping spider out there. They stop what they're doing, they back up, they wave their legs back, and so forth. And here's, I'm gonna show you some videos. These are some very, very cool jumping spiders in Australia, and um, these are courtship displays of waving legs. Okay, and I'll just show you a little bit. Um, this guy is so cute, Jürgen Ott, and he, his passion in life, he's from Denmark, his passion in life is peacock jumping spiders. Okay, and... This forest, in Sydney, in southeastern Australia, lives one of the most remarkable spiders on the planet. It's called peacock spider. It's not a big furry tarantula. It's a tiny little jumping spider. Here's one on my hand. <laughs> this is the male. He's only four millimeters long, but extremely beautifully colored. And during the mating season, between September and November, he performs an extraordinary courtship dance to impress the female. Here it comes. <laughs> Here's a male. He's looking around. He's trying to find a female. <laughs> Go 
Yeah, keep the eyes clean. He exercises his presence. <laughs> you thought human courtship was he funny, huh? There's a female. Another female arrives on the scene. <laughs> the males are getting excited. <laughs> Okay, I'll come back to this. Um, so this is a really cool courtship display, and they raise this big fan. This is why they're called peacock jumping spiders. But if you kind of look at the patterns on this, this peacock display, this one isn't all that great. Let me see if I can find another one. Blur your eyes a little bit. What do you, do you see a pattern in there? Kind of looks like another spider, doesn't it? There's a whole bunch of legs and fangy things, and on some of them, even eyeballs. Okay, so there's this, there's this other jumping spider-like stimulus um, going on here. See, some of them have eyeballs for sure. See the eyeballs there? There, look at that one. Then he dances in front of the female, quickly shaking his legs. <laughs> okay, you get the idea. Jürgen is so cute um, in his understated Danish way. But so, so these are, uh, so jumping spiders, you can see there's a whole lot of leg waving going on. So jumping spiders, they're ferocious predators. They use leg waving displays in their courtship display, but also, and I'm not gonna show you videos of this, aggressive displays. So when two jumping spiders meet, they also, um, it's kind of a eat shit and die sort of display. <laughs> That's the scientific uh, term for it. Um, and so that's kind of what you need to know about jumping spiders for the rest of this story to make sense. Okay, so Tom Eisner took this photo um, that I showed you in, um, in Arizona. This is in the Chiricahua Mountains in uh, the southeastern corner of Arizona, kind of on the Mexican, New Mexico border. And um, I spent a lot of time in these mountains doing research. And so I was in the area where these, these flies lived. And <clears throat> they live out in the desert. And they're real cool. This is a, a kangaroo rat mound. So there's a kangaroo rat that uh, lives down in this hole. And you can see it's dug up a lot of stuff. Here it's been dust bathing. They're, they come out at night. This is at dawn. And this is a wild tomato that needs sort of disturbed soil to grow. So this is a, a wild tomato, which is the host plant for this fly. 
they only live, um, they lay their eggs on this, this wild tomato. So it was pretty easy because I could just go down on find kangaroo rat mounds and find a lot of these flies. So here's one of these flies. You can see the leg-like pattern. So this is a photo I took. And what's also really interesting, and we'll come back to this, is if you look on the rear end of this thing, and Thomas Eisner noticed this as well, there's fake eye spots on its, on its rear end, right? And, and even more interesting, there's additional fake eye spots kind of in the configuration of jumping spider eyes with multiple um, eyeballs. Now, when I started watching these flies, here's what I saw. First of all, this isn't a very good mimic. I mean, it doesn't look like a spider, does it? You see it and you go, that's a weird looking fly. What I would see, you can see here's a big jumping spider and much bigger than the fly. It had been stalking, so this is in the wild. It had been stalking the fly and the fly was just about to meet its maker, okay, because if this thing pounced, it would have been game over. But what it did was it had its wings behind it and it raised them up to the sides and started waving like crazy, okay? And the result was remarkable. The jumping spider, it, it went from a little cat stalking to like this, and it started to wave its legs back at the fly and it turned around and ran away, okay? So when I started seeing this, I started thinking, my goodness, maybe this thing is a mimic of jumping spiders. The, these legs do mimic jumping spiders, but it's a very, very specific mimicry, not aimed at the whole general dangerous world out there, but it's a counterfeit, sort of a, a sheep and wolf's clothing signal that's sending a counterfeit signal to its most dangerous predator. Okay, so it's, it's a signal perhaps that's saying, I'm a mean and nasty, dangerous jumping spider, you better watch out. So um, that was my, one of my hypotheses, okay? That this, these, um, this interesting wing pattern was helping it protect it against predators, but only one group of spiders. Okay, so, <clears throat> I came up with some ideas about how to test this, and it sounds a little ghoulish, um, but I was able to make, um, I was able to do wing transplant experiments between different kinds of flies. So I could, here's a house fly. It's about the same size as this zonosomata fly. And I could um, cut off the wings of flies and glue them onto other flies. Okay, so this fly has wings that are about the same size and shape as the zonosomata flies, but they're clear. They don't have any of these patterns. And for those of you who are just making yucky faces, um, uh, wings are kind of like our fingernails. There's no nerves or blood or hemolymph or anything in them. And so you can cut them off. They don't feel anything. And um, when I, and I'll show you how I did this. So there's me when I was about your age and I had a little bit more hair. Um, and so uh, with the microscope and, and stuff, I could um, do these wing transplant experiments. And here's a house fly, and I've, it's uh, receiving wings of one of these zonosomata flies. Now the thing about house flies is they keep their wings, when they're walking around, they keep their wings folded flat on their backs, right? They never wave them around. You never see house flies doing this, right? So. I could make these, these Frankenstein different kinds of flies with um, different species with different wings. And these guys could fly completely normally and they live just as long as normal flies. So it was like, you know, you guys putting on fake fingernails, if any of you do that, it's kind of like that, just um, giving them new wings. They could fly around and, and so what I was able to do and here's a zonosomata fly with housefly wings, okay? So I was able to create a whole bunch of different kinds of flies, houseflies with the wing pattern, so they've got the morphology, the, the banding, but they don't have the behavior. They never wave them, right? And then I could produce uh, um, these, these flies that wave their wings, we know that, but so I could produce flies 
with clear wings without the pattern that waved. What would be a good control for this sort of operation to make sure that just doing wing transplant isn't having weird effects on my results? What would be a good control for this sort of wing transplant? The, the patterns? Yeah, the patterns, and, and also just normal how to slide patterns. Excellent, yeah. So a good control for this, which is important when we think about science, is we want to make sure that, you know, this weird transplant stuff isn't um, producing weird results. So um, what I also did was take the wings off one of these flies and put them onto another one of its own kind. So there would, I haven't shown you a picture, but a fly like this with other patterned wings, but from another fly. So it had the transplant operation, but it's got the, the patterned wings and so forth. So yeah, really good. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna set up a whole bunch of, of hypotheses here with this real example. And so this matrix is gonna get um, kind of complicated. Um, oh, so, so let's just review. Tom Eisner's original hypothesis were that flies are mimicking jumping spiders and it protect, protects them against a whole bunch of different sorts of predators. My idea was that the flies are mimicking the warning displays of jumping spiders and it just protects them from jumping spiders. So, um, it's, it's slightly different, um, it's quite a different hypothesis than Tom Eisner's. We always like to have what we call a null hypothesis, and maybe the, the, the patterns of those uh, leg-like bands on the wings, maybe it has nothing to do with predators. Maybe, well you, um, maybe they use that in courtship, and we know these flies do. They, they use their uh, wings in courtship and they wave them around, so maybe uh, this pattern in the wing waving has nothing to do with predators. It's all for courtship and display. So there's three different hypotheses. Okay, so let's think of this hypothesis, the if. The, so we, we're going to contrast. We're going to put up a whole bunch of bowling pins contrasting these three different hypotheses. So here's predictions that we can think of that would follow from this. So if then... So, and here's where it gets, it's gonna get pretty complicated, but the logic is exactly the same as that caddis fly example. So, if then, under each of these three different hypotheses, we can think of predictions of what we would predict on the effect of lizards, birds, praying mantises, and things like that, for these different classes of flies. So here's a normal um, fly, um, a zonosomatofly, so it's got the patterns and it can wave its wings. Here's a housefly with the pattern wings, but they don't wave, so it's got the morphology but not the behavior. Here's a zonosomatofly with housefly wings, so it waves but no pattern. And here's a housefly, so it's got clear wings and no, no waving. Okay, so we've created a bunch of different morphologies and behaviors with these, these things. And here's another sort of set of predictions we can make. Then, the effect on jumping spiders, again, of these four classes of flies. So under Eisner's idea, um, we would predict that, or he would predict that these guy, uh, generalized predators out there would eat these, right? And they would also eat those. And he would also predict that these guys with the leg-like patterns, this would protect them against lizards, birds, praying mantises, and so forth. And he was a little bit, he didn't really talk about it, but I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and say he would have said this would protect them against jumping spiders as well. You can see that the predictions from my idea are, are subtly different but important ways. Um, if I'm saying that um, this, this pattern and the behavior doesn't protect against any of these general 
predators, then um, all of these guys are going to eat all of these guys. Okay, they're not going to care um, if there's patterns and waving and, and whatnot. Um, jumping spiders <clears throat> should stalk and attack house flies. I'd predict that they would retreat from a fly that has the morphology and the wing waving behavior. And I would predict also that they would eat either a house fly that has the morphology but not the wing waving. And also they should stalk and, and try to eat the zonosomata flies that wave but they have clear wings so there's no leg-like patterns there, okay? And then if this has nothing to do with pre predation, we'd expect all predators to eat all of these flies, right? Okay. Now, I just wanna point out something that's um, subtle but interesting about how we think about doing science. So often, you know, this is a, a really complicated matrix. There's a lot of stuff there. Often, when we come up with all these sort of if-then statements, we can notice, for example, if here's a column where the predictions are all the, exactly the same, right? And here's in these, when we're contrasting the predictions of these two hypotheses, these both make the same prediction, okay? And these are what we call weak tests of a hypothesis. That is, we can go out and collect data on these things, but it's not gonna be terribly useful in allowing us to distinguish between different hypotheses, right? Doesn't have great discrimination power. If it turns out that it takes a lot of money and time and people power to go out and collect data for certain experiments, you'd wanna think really carefully about what you wanna collect data on, right? Like you could go out and collect data on this, but let's say it costs you $100,000. It's a complete waste of time and money because it's not gonna help you just discriminate between these three hypotheses, okay? And in contrast, let's look at these columns here. You can see that um, in both of these columns, the, both of these are, make different predictions about these two hypotheses, okay? So this has a lot more power in, discriminate, in discriminating potentially between these two ideas. So this is kind of a subtle thing about scientific method, but uh, we do make a distinction as scientists when we're, before we do a study, we try to think, how can we get the most bang for our buck? You know, what is worth collecting data on? Because some information is gonna be more useful than others. All right, <clears throat> so here's, again, the zonosomata fly with housefly wings. So, Here's how I did these experiments. I made a little plaster of Paris um, gladiator arena. So this is sort of the Christian and the lion experiment. And um, there's a glass top. It's a little hard to see, but uh, there's two pieces of glass. And I've just got an index card slid down the middle. Okay, and so um, there's cotton here, but there's little tubes. And so I could put the lion in one side and the Christian in the other. Let them get used to it. And these were hungry jumping spiders. They hadn't been fed for a little while. So these guys were all about stalking and pillaging and finding food. So once they calmed down, I could lift the index card. And then I would just record the behavior. What, what did they do? And this is a house fly with the patterned wings. Okay, so here's, here's some of the results. <clears throat> so these are for jumping spiders. Um, a normal, here's a normal zonosomata fly. Here's the control for the, the operation. So here's the fly you suggested, a zonosomata with other zonosomata wings. Here's a zonosomata with clear wings. And here's a house fly with the patterns and the, a normal house fly. And so what you can see is the jumping spiders, they, they, even these really hungry jumping spiders, the first thing they do is lock onto this thing that's moving around, they start to stalk it. As soon as either of these two started waving their wings, they would wave back and run to the far corner, get as far away as they could, and just sit there, okay? Um, in contrast, and um, they, they would never retreat from any of these flies. In contrast, for any of these guys, they would stalk and attack, and I would, I would try to stop these um, early before the, you know, the fly got killed. 
But um, you can see what's really interesting is this guy can wave its wings all it wants. It's not going to protect it against jumping spiders. This guy who's got the pattern, it's got the legs, but not the behavior, this doesn't protect it. So you've got to have both things. You've got to have the pattern and the waving behavior. And then it's a potent deterrent against arguably the most dangerous things that these guys are experiencing. And then I did similar sorts of experience, uh, experiments with a bunch of other predators that are out there. So other spiders, but that are not jumping spiders. Okay, so other spiders, but um, none of them wave their legs at each other like um, what you saw. Assassin bugs, praying mantis, and a lizard. Okay, so these are all things that make their living eating bugs. And uh, they attacked, and they would attack and eat all of these if they had the chance. So the big question is, what did they do? Does this thing that waves its banded legs, does it protect it against this generalized set of danger? No. They're, they love these things. They munch them all day, all day long. So now if we go back to this original really busy matrix, you can see <clears throat> I brought all this stuff. I've got to use it one more time, right? <clears throat> so I went and I collected, collected all this data. Now let me practice my form here. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I just, I just did better than I was hoping to. But let's say that there's a couple, there's a whole bunch of things still left standing. So these experiments allow us to reject um, a bunch of things. And, um, but everything, all the predictions that were made from the sheep and wolf's clothing hypothesis um, withstood these experiments. So those are still left standing. So what we can say from these experiments, we can reject Thomas Eisner's idea. We can say it's, it's wrong. Um, and we can say that, so we can reject this. What we can say is, I failed to reject this hypothesis. It still is a viable explanation. Um, we don't, being a cautious scientist, I wouldn't say it's true, even though it is. Um, <laughs> And, and we can also reject the null hypothesis. Um, it does have something to do with predation. So it turns out, oh, here's another example, um, another cool picture, another uh, jumping spider about the size of this fly. And again, it was just about to nail the sucker. And you can see it's vigorously waving its legs. This guy is starting to display back and run away. And what's really cool is since I, I published this, um, this paper, we've now discovered, or people have discovered, that this pattern of spider-like legs has evolved independently many, many, many times in the insect world um, in, in unrelated groups. So there's beetles, there's moths, there's other flies, there's lots of stuff. If jumping spider predation is a big deal, there's a lot of stuff that's evolved leg-like patterns, and they wave it. OK, um, very cool. Now, um, in the few minutes remaining, I'd just tell you, um, well, you know what? I'm going to skip over this, because um, it's going to take a little time. There's an interesting polymorphism in these flies. If you look at their rear ends, here's a fly with two fake eye spots. But again, here's another one that has multiple fake eye spots that look like it's more in the configuration of jumping spider eyes, right? And I would occasionally see jumping spiders come up from behind, directly behind flies, and they'd be stalking. And the flies wouldn't see the spiders. They wouldn't know they're just about to meet their maker. And they wouldn't display. And yet the jumping spiders would display back, would display and run away. And I, I, I was scratching my head, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. But then when I got back and was looking at my photos from a spider's eye perspective, well, these really look like jumping spider signals, even though it wasn't la waving the legs. And blur your eyes, what, do you, what does this look like on the, this pattern, this gaudy pattern on the thorax? What's it look like? A spider face, right? You got two eyes, you got some fangs. So, um, another study that an undergrad student and I did was um, 
we wanted to test the idea that these jumping spiders, in, uh, these flies, in addition to these counterfeit jumping spider signals, they festoon their whole bodies with counterfeit jumping spider signals. So even if a jumping spider um, comes from behind, it, it appears that, whoa, there's a jumping spider right there. I better back off. And we did a whole bunch of experiments that I'm not going to go through. And it, and it seems that this is um, what's going on. Um, so some take home points that I want you to get out of all of this is for the jumping spiders, thinking carefully about three different competing hypotheses and coming up with these if-then hypothesis predictions um, helped us really sort of contrast these things and figure out interesting experiments we could do. And Tom Eisner, it turns out, he was right. The flies do mimic jumping spiders, but he was right for the wrong reason. Uh, they're mimicking them uh, to, to protect them against jumping spiders. And I've got to say, Tom Eisner was really, really gracious about this. He reviewed the paper, which was published in Science. And so I was basically calling him out, saying he was full of hooey, right? And he reviewed it. He said, this is great. I'm glad to be wrong. Um, I'm glad to be right for the wrong reason. Um, and so this is a, a unique, a really cool form of mimicry where a prey is fooling, is mimicking it, something about its predator um, that protects it from a very specific um, kind of predator. And what is needed for this to work is both the morphology, the leg-like pattern, and the waving. You got to have both, right? You can't be a housefly with patterns on your wings because they don't wave their, their legs, their, their wings. Okay, so I started off saying bowling was a sort of game. There's rules. And I just want to uh, go off on a little bit of philosophize here and talk a little bit more about this process of science. OK, um, we can get interesting patterns or questions from a variety of different places. Um, my favorite source of inspiration is observing nature, going right back to mama. And then from the observations, just thinking about possible hypotheses the way you folks have suggested um, to help explain these patterns. And then the real important thing is this logical link between a hypothesis is just a suggestion and predictions, this if-then statement. So again, we can reject hypothesis. This game allows us to knock pins down, but there's um, things that are left standing. And so we, we don't say those are true. We say we've, they're still left standing. And it's also important to consider many hypotheses at the same time, if you can, because um, there could be many possible hypotheses that predict exactly the same thing. So if you're just considering, if you're kind of myopic and just consider one thing, and, and that's all you're, you're thinking about, again, you might be right for the wrong reasons. There might be another hypothesis that's actually explaining something. And so again, scientists, there's this scientific game being a rather cautious one. Um, most scientists say they, they fail to reject ideas. The pins are still left standing. But theories and laws are hypotheses and, and big ideas that have withstood the test of time. So bowling pins are, are standing. And people for a long time have been rolling data and, and experiments. And they can't knock down those pins. Okay, So they're still left standing. So theories and laws in science have a very, they're elevated hypotheses that have withstood this test of time. They're very special. We think as much as we can, according to the, the game of science, that those things are true. So we have um, you know, Newton's laws of, of um, Newton's laws, and we have um, theories of, about things which um, have really stood up to many, many attempts to knock them down. And I just want to point out that the use of the word theory by scientists is diametrically opposed generally to how the general public uses the word theory. So often you'll hear, oh, it's, it's just a theory, OK? So, you know, um, which, and 
often you'll hear, most often you'll hear this coming out of the mouths of politicians. Oh, such and such is just a theory. And to scientists, a th if you call something a theory, it's like up there on Mount Olympus, mm -hmm. right? But um, the, the colloquial loose usage of theory is, oh, like it's just a bunch of crap. We don't, we, we don't, can't say anything about it. So that's kind of interesting. When you hear in, in public use the, worst, the, the word theory, kind of ask yourself, what is it implying? And here's just some other philosophical things. Um, there are certainly, so science, this game of science, this way of sort of trying to uncover how things might work, it's just one of many ways that we as humans try to figure out um, about the universe. And there are certainly big questions that are really hard or impossible to, to get much traction with with science. So here's just a sum, a sum of them. What's the meaning of life? Why are we here? Well, why are you here tonight? Because Lori made you come. So that's an easy one. But um, is there a God? And if there is, did some, who made God? And you know things like that. There's big questions that are just really difficult to test. And they fall under the purview of things like philosophy and religion and other sorts of human endeavors. So these are certainly, these are the, some of the biggies, right? And um, it's really hard for science um, to get at them. Also, if you want to play the game of science, you have to play by the rules. And here's one of the most important ones. You've got to be willing to, to change your mind about things. And what I mean by that is you can't have an idea and, and, and say, OK, I'm going to play science, and nothing is ever going to knock this down. OK? I'm not going to let it be knocked down. Um, and if, if you don't come at something allowing data to, to falsify or knock down a bowling pin, it's, it's not science. And so this is an issue because there's a lot of things that pretend to be science, but um, people are not willing to change their minds about certain things. And so it's something else, and it's, <clears throat> we might call strongly held beliefs faith. Um, and I want to be very clear about this. I'm not saying this is a bad thing. We all have, I have certainly very, very strongly held beliefs that I don't know why I believe in them, and, but nobody's going to talk me out of them. And so I, I know I have these things that I think and I feel very strongly, and I don't know there's no good evidence for, and I'm not ever going to be able to prove them or disprove them, probably. Um, and, and I just acknowledge that and recognize it. So I'm not, um, I, I want to be very clear, I'm not saying that these, these things are bad. We all have them, but um, it's, you kind of can't throw science at some of the things that we, we think about and believe. <clears throat> and also, there's some, in this game, we could suggest certain things, but if they can never, ever be tested, um, it's just not a scientific hypothesis. So for example, with the caddis flies, I might say there's a omniscient, all-powerful, all-seeing, giant caddis fly that has decreed that those caddis flies live the way they do. Okay, that's, that's an idea, right? There's no way I could ever test that. Okay, so it's, it, and it might be true. Who knows? There might be a giant, omniscient, um, all-knowing, all-powerful caddis fly, right? Um, but it's, it's something that, with science, we couldn't test. So that's, that's something that's outside the realm of science. Here's another, I'm, I'm almost done. I'll, um, here's another co really common misperception about scientists' work. And this is what we hear from politicians and others all the time. Scientists are always arguing, right? That's what we love to do, is, is debate back and forth about what's going on. And so you'll hear, scientists are arguing about X. So pick your favorite poison here. It could be climate change. It could be whatever. Um, and they can't even agree. There's some people that say this. There's some people that say that. So science isn't working. It's broken. We can't trust scientists. And you hear that all the time, all the time. And what this means is that if scientists are arguing and debating and exchanging ideas, it means science is working exactly the way it should. It's healthy. Um, this is how science works, OK? So whenever you hear this, 
um, eh, hit the, the reject button on that person's understanding of science. And, but the real reason that sci um, science um, is like bowling is because both bowlers and scientists are paragons of fashion, right? And we, we both get to wear, like, the coolest clothes. OK. All right, thanks very much. Be happy to answer any questions, and if you want to come up and try some bowling, feel free. <laughs> yes? Why, why do the spiders have hair? Why do spiders have what? Hair. Hair. Um, a, a lot of the hairs are tactile, and they're, they're kind of like ears. They can sense um, motion, and, and, and so they're kind of hearing with a lot of those hairs. And they've got what are called chemoreceptors, so they can smell with a lot of those hairs as well. So why were the spiders scared of the flies flapping its wings? Uh, why were the spiders scared of the flies flapping its wings? My interpretation is what they perceived was leg-like patterns waving. And they have what are called feature detectors in their eyes that scan the universe for waving leg-like things and send a massive signal to the brain, we know this, and it, it gets them stopping whatever they're doing and waving back. But don't they use that in their mating? It, they use it in mating, but the first thing is generally just like, what the heck is that? Because it might be another, a more dangerous spider. So you saw, you saw how, how careful the, the male spider was. He's making his bold move. Right? And so, generally, when they see these things, they don't, they don't just right away start trying to mate with the fly. They're like, oh, what is it? I'll wave my legs. I'll try to figure it out. So it offers, it, it offers the fly a little window of protection. Yeah, great question. There's been a lot of neurobiology on all these eyeballs. It's kind of weird, you know, you got eyes. Can you imagine having eight, eight eyes and two of them facing to be pretty cool? The, the, the two big central ones, those are the most precise, accurate Galilean telescopes in the animal world. And those are the ones they, they you, you could see how they were focusing on those. Um, so those are where the feature detectors are in those central eyes. All the other ones are mainly just scanning for motion. So they, they detect motion. So they're able to detect motion at 360 degrees around them. If they detect something behind them, they can't really um, visualize it very well. And so what they'll do is they'll, they'll turn and put those headlights right on. So what's, what's the, uh, the intrinsic value of Experiment those findings other than being. Oh, I always get this. I always get this. Especially from journalists. Okay, how does this help the gross national product? How is this going to benefit people? Or not even in essence, more in like a it's sort of philosophical. Well, I guess for me, it, um, I mean, you could be cynical and say it has no value at all, but I would say. Um, these sorts of things, they've certainly shed light on something we never knew before about how animals, how evolution works, how selection works, how amazingly sophisticated it can be. And um, there's a whole new form of mimicry that we never knew existed before I did these experiments. Now people are starting to look for it and it's everywhere. So I guess in a general sense, it's, it's, there's some knowledge some information about cool stuff that's going on that we didn't know before. And I guess more generally, I would say that um, you never know when, when people are doing base, just pure science, you never know what's going to come out of it. Okay? And so uh, there was a really interesting analysis a while ago that asked the question, 
okay, people can do really directed research and say, I'm going to try to do something that helps the gross national product or develop this and make a lot of money. Um, and so if you ask the question, look out there at the stuff that um, modern industries and businesses and gross national product is based off of, most of, of that sort of stuff has come from people not setting out to discover anything really specific, but just finding basic principles and then those things being able to put to use to other ways. Yeah. I, I can, there's no more questions, I'll tell you one more really powerful story about, about that. The other story, just to illustrate that, was um, when I was a student, um, then our oldest daughter was about uh, two years old, and um, during the winter just after this, um, she came down, she was sick, and we took her into the doctor for a while, and a couple times, and he kept saying, just this crud that's going around, and just, you know, watch her, and give her plenty of fluids, all that stuff, and, but this, this thing kept hanging on, and then one night, her fever just went through the roof, it spiked, all of her blood vessels hemorrhaged, so she had blood um, hemorrhages all over her body, and she was hallucinating and convulsing, and we took her into the doctor, and he freaked out, and bent her over, and the thing that saved her life is he injected into her juggler um, some widespread antibiotics. He didn't know what, what was going on, but he had his suspicions, and then she was flown to a pediatric intensive care unit, was about five minutes from death. She spent about two weeks in the intensive pediatric care unit, um, and they finally got her better. She had um, meningitis and massive septicemia, so uh, bacterial infections. Her, her blood was just this um, massive infection. And so it was the drugs that, that saved her life. And then after that, her kidneys had been damaged, and, and they weren't growing properly, so she was put, after she got better, she was put on another drug to help with her kidneys, but, um, and she was monitored every year to see if her kidneys were growing, and they weren't, and they were gonna have to operate on her kidneys, and, and so I, this is sort of a long rambling story, but it's worth it, bear with me. So after I graduated um, from Princeton, I got a, a postdoc, and I was funded by um, an interesting company, um, and they paid me to do this postdoc stuff, and, um, but they flew me down, um, and there was this fancy lunch, and they sat me next to this, this old guy who's in his 80s, um, Dr. George Hitchings was his name, and they sat me by him because he had just been to the Galapagos, and they knew I'd, been, I'd dropped out of high school and lived for a year in the Galapagos, and so I was talking to him about the Galapagos, and then, then I said, well, t tell me about what, what, you know, tell me a little bit about you, and, and so he said, well, I was a microbiologist, and um, I got really, really interested in studying bacterial metabolic pathways, like all the enzymes and what they, they do, and, and he said, I worked for years and years and years on this stuff, and he said, eventually I kind of, I was doing all this just trying to figure out stuff like this. And then he said, I realized that there's this really important um, bacterial metabolic pathway, and there's an enzyme, and there's pathogens, there's bacteria that kill millions of people every year, and there's one enzyme in this pathway, this bacteria needs this pathway, there's one enzyme that this bacteria has that we don't have. If I can figure some way to knock out that enzyme, um, that might be a really potent drug for, you know, because one of the problems with drugs is that if we take them, they can damage us, as well as the thing we're, we're hoping to, to kill, right? So he said, I figured out and I, I, for years and years, and I, I finally came up with these um, compounds that knocked out that enzyme, and I created these drugs. And I, and I asked him, I said, well, you know, what were some of the drugs? And he said, oh, amoxicillin, septra, all these widespread <laughs> antibiotics that had saved my daughter's life. Uh. And so I was like, can I kiss your feet? <laughs> and um, and so, so I told him this story about Allison, and, um, who was in the Honors College, by the way. Um, and 
And I told him the story that she was, her kidneys were in trouble, but the drug she was on that she had to take every day was another drug he invented. <laughs> and so I, I told him the story that we're worried because, you know, her kidneys aren't growing. And so then, you know, I laughed and, I, and that was that. And for me, it was this incredibly powerful experience, meeting this guy, talking to him about this research which had led to this, this stuff. And so a while later, he won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. <laughs> And then I was at this conference, and I was this little guy there. I had a little poster up, and there was all these people around. And, and so there was this big commotion and, and all this stuff going on. And it was George Hitchings walking into this big conference room, surrounded by all the, the press, because he'd just been awarded the Nobel Prize. And he's sort of walking around, and he's coming my way. And, I had only been with him for this lunch, and it was like, you know, he's 85, and, he's, and it was a long time before this. And so in my head, I was rehearsing this really elaborate reintroduction. Oh, Dr. Hitchings, you don't re remember me, but, you know, da 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 So he's about halfway over, and he, he looks across, and he, he sees me, and he just makes a beeline right for me. And he comes up, and he said, so, how's Allison? <laughs> and, and, and it just so happened that the day before, my wife had flown up to Nova Scotia with Allison to get checked out, and the doctors checked her kidneys, and they said, her kidneys are great, you have a healthy little girl, you can take her off this drug. So I told them, I said, you won't believe this, yesterday, she was given a clean bill of health, we took her off your drug yesterday. And he started crying, and he said, to me, this means more than a Nobel Prize ever could. And, uh, oh, I know. <laughs> so, so that's sort of a long, rambling answer to, to a question that I get all the time. But I guess what I'd say is you never know what research is going to lead to. <laughs>